hello, and thank you all so much for having me. Uh, once again, the, you know, my name is Skip Stewart, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Improvement Officer at Baptist Memorial Healthcare, headquartered in Memphis, Tennessee. And, you know, the title of this uh, article or this uh, presentation uh, is, How is Your Management System Working? There's a similar title that Lean Frontiers has also, if you have an interest. But the, I basically want you to reflect on that question today. Even though I'm going to tell you a little bit about our management system, I'd like you to consider your management system and whether everything is connected properly. So once again, we're headquartered in Memphis, Tennessee. We have around 22 hospitals spread over Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas, about 180 plus uh, clinics and a college of health science and some other uh, joint ventures and uh, different parts of our health system. Uh, most people, when they hear of the Baptist management system, they connect it to this little blue brain. Uh, it's kind of a little branding of ours. At the bottom of that blue brain, it says, show me your thinking. So we're trying to connect everything um, to this thinking process when it comes to our management system. Now, the first question, obvious, is what is a system? And the human body is an example of a system. See, for example, it's consisting of interdependent subsystems, things like the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the digestive system. Any one of these parts or subsystems cannot function and survive on its own. The body lives and thrives in the interactions of those subsystems. Now, this car here, I think, is even a better example of what a system is. Many of us drive cars and are familiar with them. The purpose of a car is to get you from point A to point B, but no part of a car by itself can get you from point A to point B. It's only when the parts interact do they bring about the property that we're looking for. Not only is that the case, but if you cut the connections between all the parts, the individual parts lose their properties. For example, the engine, the property of an engine is to create movement. But if you take an engine out of a car and put it on the ground, it can't even move itself. So it's very important if we're going to call something the Baptist management system that we understand what a system is. The other thing that we're trying to do within the Baptist management system is make sure we're grounded in principles. Uh, this particular model comes from the Shingo Institute out of Utah, and I have the privilege and honor of being a Shingo examiner. And these principles, we start at the bottom with what we call the cultural enablers, lead with humility and respect every individual. And then built upon that is five principles of continuous improvement, things like flow and pull value, assure quality at the source, focus on process, embrace scientific thinking, seek perfection. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but imagine that these 10 principles are not independent, but they're interdependent. They're working off of each other to bring about the ultimate results that we're trying to get. One way to think about it is they're laid out in people, process, purpose, and stakeholders. So we're trying to make sure that the Baptist management system is grounded in principles. Now, I like to use this little model here, this gear train model, to explain the Baptist management system. Uh, it's only a model, and as the little yellow box says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so you, we find gear trains and engines and machinery and things of that nature. And I'm just going to use it as a model because some people can relate to it because it's shaped in a hierarchical format. And how should we think about continuous improvement or our Baptist management system at every level? I also like to put there on the right that second law of thermodynamics, entropy, just to remind me that sustainment is very tough because everything is in a constant state of de deterioration and degradation. We want to make sure that we have the scientific iterative process of plan, do, study, adjust at every single level within the organization. And so let's kind of look at how it's put together. There's Brad Parsons, the CEO of the Northeast Arkansas uh, uh, Healthcare System in Jonesboro, Arkansas, part of the Baptist uh, family. And in the background is his chief financial officer. And this is an unfinished room that they have where they meet once a month. I think it's the second Tuesday of every month at 9 a.m. 
and they go through what they call strategic A3s. Now at the top of that court board are the true north uh, uh, trajectories of we're trying to provide the right care at the right time at the right place and the right cost. So if you come to Baptist anywhere at Baptist and start that sentence off, someone will finish it for you. We want to provide the right care at the right time at the right place and the right cost. Now under each one of those themes, uh, you might have one or more columns. And those columns are made up of first, the top sheet is a strategic A3 on some overarching gap that needs to be shut, that must be shut uh, for that particular entity. And it's laid out in a PDSA plan, do, study, adjust format. The second sheet of paper is what's known as a status A3. And that's where they're making their study and adjust portions throughout the year. Because what they know for a fact is that whatever they started the year off with, something was wrong. It was nothing more than a hypothesis. So they need to make study and adjust there. And the third sheet of paper is the metrics. So there is a key thought leader for each column. And this whole team, Brad and his administration team, get up there every single a month and they go through where are they at, what adjustments are they moving, so that they're PDSAing at the very highest level. Uh, for those that are more interested in this, if you go on YouTube to Baptist Management System, you can see some videos about this. Baptist Management System on YouTube if you have more interest. Then at the next level, the same process is going to happen, but it's going to happen at the departmental level. And instead of a strategic A3, we'll call that a tactical A3. It's in the exact same format, but it's at a department level. So this department here is going to have a huddle meeting, not monthly, but weekly. And they're going to have it weekly on every shift. And they're going to talk about the gaps that they're trying to shut that are connected to the strategic A3. So every single week on every shift, they're going to have this meeting. Then on a daily basis, uh, there's groups that are going to have what's known as the improvement kata and coaching kata meeting. So for 20 minutes a day, every day, they're going to come to the storyboard and they're going to practice kata. And they're going after some challenge. They're experimenting their way towards a challenge that's connected to the huddle board, which is connected to the safe room where the monthly meeting is done. So every single day, Monday through Friday for 20 minutes a day. You can see there on the, the wall, uh, the, the time I took the picture, there were 42 weeks left. In this next picture, you can see there's a learner, there's a coach, there's always a learner, there's always a coach, and sometimes there's a, a third person that plays a second coach. But once again, they're experimenting towards a challenge, a 52-week challenge that's connected to the huddle board, that's connected to the safe room. So the huddle board in this picture is on the right there in green. And then we also practice a tremendous amount of TWI, which stands for Training Within Industry. Um, and this right here happens to be a picture of Patrick Gropp and a group in an OR that was doing some TWI job instructions on counting in the OR. TWI job instructions is how we demystify a job and then we feather it back into a learner's brain and we create a standard behavior. But you would not do this work right here for the sake of doing it. You would do it because in your improvement efforts, let's say your improvement kata, you've discovered that every Tom, Dick, and Harry is doing a task completely different. And that variation of everyone doing it different is causing mistakes and errors. So that's why they're doing this TWI job instructions. Within the TWI uh, umbrella, we look at three areas. TWI job instructions, that blue card there on the left is a tool that we use in that to create that standard behavior. Uh, the yellow card stands for TWI, the tool that we use in TWI job relations, and it's going to be used at every level in this little gear train, at the CEO level, 
all the way to the front level. But what TWI Job Relations is, is a scientific way to get people to follow our leadership and then to deal with people problems when they occur. Because at the end of the day, everything we're doing is through people. I always like to say that TWI Job Relations is the best way I know to operationalize respect for every individual. And then that third little green card there is TWI Job Methods, which was really the origin of Kaizen events. And so uh, we use that to really question a process and to pull ideas out of the real people that do the real work at the front line to see what experiments we can run and uh, what new patterns of work could we test out. So those are the three legs of the stool, we'll call it, TWI Job Instructions, TWI Job Relations, and TWI Job Methods. Here is another picture of a uh, TWI Job Instructions of where they were looking at a blood culture job using a central line. But once again, the reason they're breaking this job down to create a standard behavior is not just for the sake of doing it, but they've discovered in their improvement, Kata, that everyone's doing this job different. And as a result of that variation, it's creating errors and mistakes. And then this final picture here uh, is another blood culture a job. And what was interesting about this job was the nurse that was in the middle, when she was done, when we were done training her, she looked up and said, I've been a nurse for 27 years. And until today, I didn't know you were supposed to use the blue bottle first and then the purple bottle. I just did what I was told to do. And see, that's problematic. When we only do what we're told to do, that gives us the opportunity to make errors and mistakes. We need to know the why behind it. So there's an example. It's not meant to be holistic. Uh, as other parts come along, we add it. We have to make sure it's connected properly. We like to call it connecting the dots. Uh, this is very fragile. So instead of using entropy, I use the word fragile. It's just a model. And as people come up with other uh, elements, like this one hospital is putting in what they call the idea-driven organization, where every single person has the opportunity to share ideas. Uh, as they work on that and work out the kinks, it ultimately became part of their management system. And it was connected to the rest of the work. So there's just a simple example from top to bottom, how it's connected. Uh, some more things to think about is that we have some other elements, even though I didn't put them in the gears. Uh, the shepherding group is a very important group of how we look at our improvers' work, uh, how we're helping them when they struggle. Uh, some people like to call the shepherding group, how do we kata our kata? And then we have what we call the get better jumpstart. Uh, get better is just part of our branding. And what Get Better Jumpstart is, is a traditional Kaizen event done kata style. So those are some other parts. So I'm not gonna go through every part, but it gives you an idea of how some elements are connected. As we're doing this work though, we're trying to look at the work through the lenses of these guiding principles. We wanna be looking at the work and making sure that the work supports and doesn't work against these guiding principles. So you heard me talk a lot about entropy. Uh, that's one of the reasons we have such a hard time uh, sustaining that second law of thermodynamics, saying that everything is constantly degrading. But lately I've been calling it the melting sandcastle. And I got that from Jim Lancaster, the CEO at Lantech in Louisville, Kentucky. He wrote a wonderful book called The Work of Management, A Daily Path to Sustainable Improvement. And if you think about that sandcastle there, there's a lot of elements that want to tear it down. Uh, the ocean, the wind, uh, kids, dogs running up and down. And so if you're going to keep it intact, you're going to be, you're going to have to be intentional. You're going to have to shore it up. You're going to have to protect it. And that's very true with the management systems that we're putting in place. So I've been using the phrase, your sandcastle wants to melt lately. So let's talk a little more about the Baptist management system. You heard me earlier on those principles talk about people, purpose, and process. And those are very important dimensions. I would even make the argument that those three dimensions have got to be in your management system. Uh, and if they are properly connected, 
and you'll get the results you're looking for. But you can't think about these three dimensions as independent. You have to think about them as interdependent. They're working off of each other. And yes, within each dimension, there are lots of tools, there's lots of techniques, there's lots of things to look at, but I think we have to constantly think about purpose, people, and process and how they're interacting. There's a much more difficult example, this geometry figure, than just of a triangle. And so I use this figure a lot to think about the complicated management systems that we live in. There on the right is the principles that make up the Baptist management system. You'll notice they're very similar to the Shingo Institute, but a little different. So for example, instead of saying respect for every individual, we just call it respect. And then we added things like trust and empathy. But you don't want to look at these 11 principles as independent principles, but interdependent. They're working off of each other. Uh, here's an example. I would give you, I would say that unless you show people respect and approach them with humility, you could be the greatest engineer or greatest scientist in the world, but it's going to be very difficult to coach someone forward. So these principles are working off of each other interdependently. Same thing with the elements on the left. Those are some of the elements of the Baptist management system, but they're not independent. They're interdependent. So let's talk a little more about some of those elements that make up the Baptist management system. So some of y'all might be asking yourself, what in the world is a kata? And that's a fair question. That little girl there happens to be uh, conducting a kata, happens to be practicing a routine. A kata is simply nothing more than this. It's a routine that you practice so that its pattern becomes an automatic habit that gives you some new skill. So right now at Baptist, we have people every single day all throughout our system practicing kata. There's a learner, there's a coach, sometimes there's a second coach, but they're practicing, they're scientifically practicing this mental routine that we call the improvement kata. And they're experimenting their way forward to try to improve healthcare. So that model there in front of you that's called the mental model, um, that's what's known as the improvement kata. It comes out of the original work of Mike Rother in his book, Toyota Kata. Uh, now there on the bottom is his newest book, the Toyota Kata Practice Guide, which I would highly recommend. And we took that model and we baptized it. So on the far right is just our logo with the word vision inside of it. And then we move to step one, the challenge. A challenge is a strategic imperative. It's a game changer. It's not what we can work on to improve, but it's what we must work on. And it can be one to three years out. We tend to say, 52 weeks from now. 52 weeks from now, where must we be? So that's the first step. Then the second step is grasping the current condition. Now, each step is going to frame the next step. So on step two, we're trying to grasp the current condition in light of that challenge. And the current condition in its basic form is made up of three pieces. One is the result metrics. So for anyone listening that's ever went to a sporting event and maybe basketball or football or baseball and you've looked up at the scoreboard, that's like a result metric. In healthcare, we have things like the number of infections, the number of falls, um, the collection rates in the billing department. Those are all result metrics and they're an important piece, but they're not the only piece of the current condition. Then we have process metrics that contribute to those result metrics. Uh, those things might be, in the sporting example, might be how many yards we ran the football, how many penalties we had, how many passes we completed. And so those would be process metrics that contributed to the result metric of the scoreboard. But the final thing, and probably the most important thing to me, is what's the pattern of work within the current condition? How are we playing the game? What's the eye test? Ever how we're playing the game or the pattern of work? that's going to make us have the process metrics and the result metrics. So that's step number two. Step number three says, what is the next target condition? The magic word there is the word next. It implies there are multiple target conditions on my way to the challenge. So if my challenge is 52 weeks from now, then my next target condition is gonna be two to three weeks from now. But if the current condition is reality, the target condition is a hypothesis. 
It's saying, how do I hypothesize that I need to play the game? And if I play the game like that in two to three weeks, what process metrics and what result metrics will that manifest? So the current condition is reality. The next target condition is a hypothesis. And then we look at the obstacles that are separating us from the next target condition. And I know you might ask yourself, why are the obstacles shaped like a heart? We got that from our good friend, Brandon Brown. And uh, he would always say the obstacles are really the heart of the matter. And we have found that to be true. And so once we articulate what the obstacles are, then we go to step four. We PDSA, plan, do, study, adjust through one obstacle at a time. So this model here that you're looking at, a couple things about it. It's iterative. It's also, as my friend Beth Carrington likes to say, it's a meta routine that stays the same regardless of the circumstances. It's a routine way of acting and thinking. Uh, also, it's content neutral, this model. I can use it in healthcare. I can use it outside of healthcare. And then finally, it's fractal. I've used this model to coach CEOs and I've used this model to coach frontline nurses. So now we have to ask the question, how do we make this mental model, this meta routine, how do we make it more than just theory? And so we're gonna talk about that. But once again, the four steps are, understand the direction and the challenge, grasp the current condition, establish the next target condition, and iterate towards the target condition. To make that model, uh, part of our natural way that we think, we have to use scientific coaching because we don't naturally think that way. We tend to naturally jump to conclusions. And a lot of times folks will say, Skip, why do you call it scientific coaching? Well, because that's what it is. Also because we live in a day and age where everyone uses the word coach very generically, kind of like we use the word friend on Facebook. So we have to scientifically coach the learner forward. And this little card is just a starter. It's not the end all, but it gets us started on that process. Here's what that improvement kind of model looks like in the real world. It's a little more messier. And here's a couple things to recognize about it. You cannot reach the overall challenge right away. The path to the target condition is not predictable or straight. You have to experiment your way through those little hearts that represent the obstacles on your way to the target condition. So as you're moving towards that target condition by experimenting through those obstacles, you're making adjustments based on what you learn. So there's a learner, there's a coach, and they're at a storyboard. Um, now, even though they're smiling, the reality is the improvement kata and coaching kata is a skill. And so anytime you're learning a skill, you feel like that little cartoon character. You feel uncomfortable, you feel awkward, you may not be happy about it. Um, and so it, it's, it doesn't feel good. It maybe even feels forced sometimes. But on this board, we have the 52 week challenge. We have an area where we establish our current condition. We have an area where we set up the next target condition an area for our obstacles, and an area where we're gonna experiment against those obstacles. The coach also feels awkward. They also feel uncomfortable because they're learning a new skill. Many times they're thinking to themselves, uh, why can't I just tell people what to do? But that's not really coaching. And so they're learning a new skill. So right now at Baptist, we have folks at every level, in these pictures, you have CEOs, you have chief nursing officers, directors, uh, and we have folks learning how to experiment their way forward, learning how to think in a different way. You've heard me use the term plan, do, study, adjust a lot. Uh, just for those that may not be familiar on the call, uh, the first step is plan. We want to make a prediction of what we're going to do and what do we expect as a result of doing that. And then we're going to do it. We're going to try it and take the step. And then we're going to study it. We're going to observe and measure and see what actually happens. And then finally, we're going to adjust. We're going to evaluate based on the outcomes and what did we learn. And we really believe that this is probably one of the most effective ways we have to move through this unpredictable territory. Physicians have been using this approach their entire career. They obtain the patient's history, they conduct diagnostic testing, and then they do the treatment. 
And then they might follow up. Many times they do, they follow up and assess the patient's response. And many times they have to make adjustments to the medication and to the therapy. They've been doing this their whole career. We're now trying to do it around the work that revolves around them. So there's a learner, there's a coach, and there's a second coach. Now the learner and the coach show up to the board every day for 20 minutes a day. The learner does have a team behind them, but it's just the learner and the coach that predominantly show up. The second coach might show up once or twice a week. The learner and the team own the target condition and work to achieve it. The coach is responsible for teaching the improvement kata, those four steps, and they're also responsible for the results. The second coach is responsible for assuring the development of the coach and assuring alignment to the organizational goals. I always like to refer to TWI as another form of a kata because just like kata is creating new learning patterns, just like it's creating a new uh, a neural pathway in our brain, so does TWI, both in JI, JR, and JM. So TWI and kata is like a marriage made in heaven. So uh, highly recommend uh, those, even, even though you may not use those, I would ask you to at least uh, to look at them and consider them. So recently, um, uh, two friends of mine, Patrick Gropp and Brad Parsons, had the privilege and honor of capturing our thoughts in this book, Creating an Effective Management System. And you know, if you have any uh, interest in some more of this, I would invite you to go to Amazon and, and grab the book. Uh, we're not trying to go over every element. Uh, one friend of mine uh, from Florida told me, he said, Skip, when I finished reading the book, I just had more questions. And I said, then great, that's what we, that's what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, and so we, we're just trying to get you to reflect on your own management system and ask the question, are all the dots being connected properly? So I would just encourage you to continue to do that. And thank you so much for allowing me uh, to uh, provide this presentation today.